Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our training today. <coughs> our training is specifically aimed at managers. We'll be looking to clarify your roles and your responsibilities with regard to the health and safety of employees and also those affected by your activities. First, let me take a moment to introduce the National Institute for Occupational Health to you. The NIOH, together with the National Institute for Community Diseases, or NICD, are divisions of the National Health Laboratory Service, the NHLS. The NHLS provides pathology services to around 80% of people living in South Africa. This is done through more, more than 350 laboratories which are spread out throughout the country. The NIOH is a division of the NHLS and we specifically focus on matters pertaining to occupational health. These services include research, specialised laboratory services and training amongst other activities. Perhaps also mention that we are a World Health Organisation collaborating centre. Back to today's training. Today we will be basing our training very much on the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The reason for this is the Act provides for the basis from which all the activities need to stem. In order to try to ensure that we can assist as many as possible, we are pegging the training at a fairly basic level. The intention is to assist you to ensure that you take steps to care for your greatest asset, and that is your people. Many other training resources, including posters, online training events, and fact sheets can be found on the NIOH website, and I'd encourage you to go and take a look at the website. You'll find it at www.nioh.ac.za. Log on and take a look. With that, I'd like to introduce Michelle Morgan. Michelle is the uh, Deputy Safety Health and Environment Manager for the National Health Laboratory Service, and she's going to be presenting today. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you, David. As David mentioned, my name is Michelle Morgan, and I am the Deputy Manager for the SHE Department. And um, thank you, Glenn. I'd like to begin by giving you a brief introduction into COVID-19. On the 31st of December 2019, WHO China reported a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China. A virus was identified, which was subsequently called SARS-CoV-2, and the disease caused by the virus is known as COVID-19. Initially, the majority of the cases were epidemiologically linked to seafood, poultry, and live wildlife markets. The number of cases continued to increase rapidly, and evidence of person-to-person -person transmission is now established. If you look at the uh, Coronavirus International map, you will see that um, the very light blue represents areas or countries with zero to 49 confirmed COVID-19 cases per 1 million people. The very dark blue at the other end shows you a thousand and greater COVID-19 cases per 1 million people. So looking at the map, you can see the extent of COVID-19 internationally. Almost every country of the world is affected by this virus. Coming back to South Africa, on the 5th of March, 2020, the Minister of Health, Dr. Zweli Mkhize, announced the country's first confirmed COVID-19 case. Shortly thereafter, on the 15th of March, the President of the Republic of South Africa declared the outbreak a national disaster. On the 23rd of March, 2020, the president then announced a 21-day lockdown for South Africa. As of this morning, there's a total of 1,845 cases of confirmed COVID-19. There are a total of 18 deaths and 45 people have recovered from the virus. Initially, all positive cases were imported, 
Subsequently, we are picking up positive cases of local transmission. As David mentioned, there will be a focus on the OHS legal requirements for managers. This is occupational health and safety. The Occupational Health and Safety Act 85 of 1993 came into effect on the 1st of January 1994. The Act has 50 sections and various regulations. What is the aim of the Act? The aim of the Act is to provide for the health and safety of persons at work, the health and safety of persons in connection with the use of plant and machinery, the protection of persons other than persons at work against hazards to health and safety arising out of or in connection with the activities of persons at work, to establish an advisory council for occupational health and safety and to provide for matters connected therewith. The purpose of the OSH Act. What is meant by reasonably practicable? This term is often mentioned in the Act. I will explain to you in detail what reasonably practicable means. But in general, it means doing what you are reasonably able to ensure, to do to ensure the health and safety of workers. Reasonably practicable means practicable, practicable having regard to the severity and scope of the hazard or risk concerned, the state of knowledge reasonably available concerning the hazard or risk of, or, and of any means of removing or mitigating the hazard or risk, the availability and suitability of means to remove or mitigate that hazard or risk, and the cost of removing or mitigating that hazard or risk in relation to the benefits deriving therefrom. Moving on to some common definitions in the Act, an employee is any person who is employed by or works for an employer and who re receives or is entitled to receive any remuneration or, or works under the direction of a, or supervision of an employer. An employer means a person who employs or provides work for any person and remunerates that person or express, expressly or tacitly undertakes the remun to remunerate him. Moving on to the sections of the OSH Act. As I mentioned, there are 50 sections. I will just be focusing and highlighting the most pertinent sections in terms of the roles and responsibilities of management. And in this presentation, with respect to COVID-19. Section seven refers to health and safety policy. So what does it exactly means is that there must be a written policy in an organization. This policy needs to have a, a bit of background of the type of organization, the description of the work being performed. It needs to be in writing, signed by the CEO, and it needs to be displayed in a prominent location. General duties of the employer to his employees. As I understand, this is a management presentation, so I believe that majority of the attendees are managers. So this section is actually very relevant to you. Directly, I quote from the Act, every employer shall provide and maintain, as far as reasonably practicable, a working environment that is safe and without risk to the health of his employees. So I have listed, I've actually got four slides that include the duties of the manager. And I want you to just um, take note of the highlighted words in each of those four slides. You will notice that the words that keep coming up is safe, safety, health, risk, hazard, and measures. So if I move to slide the slide on risk assessment, you will see the definition of a risk assessment is the process of assessing the risks associated with the hazards identified so that appropriate control measures can be put in place to eliminate or mitigate the risk to protect the health and safety of workers. So if I go back to those duties, 
in general, duty A to duty J, the 10 duties, actually encompass the risks in the workplace and the hazards and the steps that need to be taken by the employer to manage those risks and to maintain and create a workplace that is safe and healthy for all his staff. So I'm going to quickly go through uh, each duty. So um, section A, you must provide a workplace that is safe without risk to health. B, take steps to eliminate or mitigate the hazards. C, ensure the safety and absence of risks. D, establish what hazards exist. E, establish what precautionary measures should be taken. F, provide information, instructions, training and supervision. G, not permit employees to work unless precautionary measures are taken. H, take measures to ensure that the requirements of the Act are complied with. I, enforcing such measures. And J, ensuring that work is performed under general supervision of a trained person. So as I mentioned, each duty has reference to health, safety, risk, hazard, and measures. So from this, managers, you can take home the message that your risk assessment is vitally important in every workplace. It is the foundation of setting up a health and safety system that will be effective and ultimately achieve what you what is required to achieve, i.e. the health and safety of your employees. So moving on to the risk assessment process, every workplace, be it a lab, a hospital, a lab, I mean, sorry, an office, a workshop, every workplace must ensure that there is a risk assessment done documented and in place. In terms of COVID-19, remember there are many additional risks associated with the virus itself and the disease. So therefore your current risk assessment must be reviewed to include the risks associated with COVID-19. For each identified risk, appropriate risk measures should be selected and implemented to mitigate the residual risk to an acceptable level. The approved risk assessment must be recorded, as I mentioned, in writing and communicated to all staff in your workplace. You can communicate in various ways, either by email, either by a presentation, or uh, by giving each uh, staff member a, a pamphlet or a handout where you can go home and read through this. But this is very important. Communication is very important and staff must read and familiarize themselves with the contents of the risk assessment. This is just a, a slide that shows hierarchy of controls when you are implementing controls after you have identified your risks and evaluated the hazard associated, the risk associated with the hazard. Section 13 refers to duty to inform. Without derogating from any specific duty imposed on an employer by the OSH Act, every employer shall, as far as reasonably practicable, cause every employee to be made conversant with the hazards in the workplace and make sure that precautionary measures that are in place are taken by employees. Inform safety reps beforehand of any inspections, investigations, or formal inquiries by inspector. Inform health and safety reps as soon as reasonably practicable of any incident in the workplace. So moving on to employees. Whilst we stress the importance and the responsibility of employers in a workplace, equally responsible are you, the employees. Employees need to comply they need to cooperate and they need to obey. So you need to take reasonable care for the health and safety of yourself and of others who may be affected by your acts or missions. 
You need to cooperate with your employer. You need to um, perform duties that have been instructed for you to perform. You need to carry out any lawful order given to you and obey health and safety rules at all times. You also have to report any unhealthy or unsafe uh, situation that comes to your attention. You also need to report an incident where you are affected or your health is affected or there's an injury to yourself. Right, moving on to section 16. This is the chief executive officer charged with certain duties. Every chief executive officer shall, as far as reasonably practicable, ensure that the duties of employees as contemplated in the act are properly discharged without derogating from his responsibility in terms of the act a ceo may assign any duty contemplated in the subsection to any person under his control this is actually referen with reference to section 16.2 appointments where a ceo can delegate duties to um, executive directors senior managers and then senior managers can in turn delegate duties to junior managers or floor managers, whatever the case may be. Different companies will have different structures in place. But what I want to emphasize is that whilst a CEO can delegate these duties, the CEO will remain responsible and will be held accountable in all respects. Moving on to section 17, health and safety reps. Okay, so if you have more than 20 employees in your workplace, you need to appoint a rep. Who, how must the appointment be made? It must be made in writing for a specified period. You as a company will decide on that period. Who is eligible? It is only full-time employees and only employees that are familiar with the workplace and the conditions thereof. How many should be appointed for shops and offices? It's one for every 100 employees. All other workplace, workplaces, it's one for every 50. When are activities conducted? These must be conducted during ordinary working hours and managers must ensure that any time spent by employees is time that is um, seen as part of their duty. Sorry about that. So you need to ensure that the time sent, spent by employees, you allow them time away from their normal activities for them to carry out their activities or duties in their role as their health and safety rep. The functions of safety reps. So I'm not going to go through each one of them, but just highlight the important points. Review effectiveness of measures, identify potential hazards, examine the causes of incidents, investigate complaints, make representations to the employer, make representations to the health and safety committee, and inspect the workplace. Participate in consultations with inspectors, receive information from inspectors, and attend meetings in your capacity as a safety rep. Moving on to section 19, that's the health and safety committees, an employer shall, in respect of each workplace, where there are two or more health and safety reps, establish one or more committees. If there is one health and safety committee, then all the safety reps in that workplace must be members of that committee. If there are more than one committee, two or more committees, then the uh, health and safety reps must be members of at least one of those committees. Remember, that um, the persons nominated by the employer cannot exceed the number of safety reps on a committee. A safety committee must meet, they can meet as often as they would deem fit, but by law they must meet at least once every three months. The safety committee, as I mentioned before, can co-opt one or more persons by reason of their knowledge and this is called the advisory member. Kindly note that the advisory member is not entitled to vote. What are the functions of the safety committee? 
The safety committee is a committee made up of the safety reps, management reps, advisory members. Important aspects are dis discussed at this committee and they then make re 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 recommendation to the employer. The health and safety committee shall keep a record of each recommendation made. The health and safety committee cannot by law incur any civil liability. And the employer shall take the prescribed steps to ensure that health and safety committee complies with the provisions of the OSH Act. Moving on to general safety regulations. Personal safety equipment and facilities. It is the employer's responsibility to provide free of charge safety equipment and facilities to staff. He is also responsible to maintain the safety equipment in a good clean condition. Safety equipment, safety PPE, etc., must not be allowed to be taken away from the workplace or taken home. This can cause unnecessary exposure of staff and their families to hazards in the workplace. The employer must instruct employees, give them training on proper use, maintenance, and very importantly, the limitations of the equipment. Intoxication. Employees under the influence of intoxicating liquor or drugs are not permitted on the workplace. Employees at work who are, are not, not permitted also to have these things in their possessions. If you are on medication, you need to inform your manager of your medication and also you are only permitted to work if the side effects do not constitute any danger to yourself or the others. Admittance of persons, an employer shall not permit persons to enter a workplace where the health and safety of such persons is at risk. In the interest of health and safety, an employer shall post up a notice at the entrance of the workplace prohibiting the entry of unauthorized persons to such a workplace. You would see that the biohazard label, this is actually specific to a um, health and safety uh, workplace such as a laboratory or a hospital. But general workplaces will probably be having this signage. Moving on to first aid, emergency equipment and procedures. If you have greater than five employees at a workplace, the employer must provide a first aid box. The first aid box must have the minimum requirements and these are listed in the general safety regulations. If you have greater than 10 employees, there must be a, first, a trained first aider for every 50 employees. The location of the first aid box must be known to all. It must be prominently displayed with a, a sign like the one on the top there. And then it, its location must also be known to all. Continuing on first aid emergency equipment and procedures, where there is a potential hazard of injury to the eye from a biological or chemical substance, an eye wash facility must be available. This will be mostly in cases of, as I mentioned, healthcare facilities and also in um, chemical industry where they produce or manufacture chemicals. Staff must be trained on the use of the eye wash. In the case of large amounts of toxic or corrosive substances, there must be a deluge shower provided for staff. Staff must also be trained. Moving on to general administrative regulations, the copy of the OSH Act. If there are greater than five employees, the employer must have a copy of the Act available for his employees at the workplace. This can be either in the form of a booklet or as a, um, um, a notice board. If there are less than five employees, the employer must make the copy available to an employee upon request. Reporting of incidents and, and accidents and occupational diseases. The employer shall, within seven days of an incident, give notice to the provincial director in the form of a WCL1 or a WCL2. If an employee, as a consequence of the above incident, dies, becomes unconscious, suffers the loss of a limb or part of the limb, is injured or becomes ill, and is likely to die or suffer permanent physical defect, such as <clears throat> Such an incident, sorry, must be reported to the provincial director by telephone or fax. 
A registered medical practitioner must within 14 days of the examination or treatment of a person for an occupational disease give notice to the chief inspector and to the employer. Recording and investigation of incidences. Coming back to COVID-19 in the workplace, there may be incidences of exposure, either communal exposure or workplace exposure. And these um, points are very relevant and are part of the responsibility of management. An employer must keep a record of all incidents occurring at the workplace. All incidents must be investigated. Incidents must be kept on record, on file, or in an occupational health and safety information system. All incidents recorded must be tabled and examined by the health and safety committee of that workplace at the next meeting. Moving on to the facilities regulations of the OSH Act, sanitation. Sanitation is a very important. It includes providing a toilet with a proper toilet pan, a toilet seat, toilet paper free of charge, disposable paper towels, facilities for washing, drying, and cleaning your hands, and toilet soap and cleansing agent free of charge. Although these may seem that it is something simple and uh, taken for granted, it may not always be the case. So the facilities re regulations has made it legal and therefore every manager and employer must comply. Moving on to facilities for safekeeping, the employer must provide employees with a personal facility for safe safekeeping. And this is for the purpose of the safe storage of clothing and other personal items. Changing rooms. If an employer has to change or undress for his work, there needs to be separate changing rooms and also separate for males and females. The room must be separated from the workplace where hazardous biological and chemical hazards are handled. The room must have natural and artificial ventilation with glazed windows. Dining rooms, workplaces handling hazardous chemical and biological agents must provide employees with a dining room or an eating place on the work premises. The space must be, have sufficient chairs and tables for the total number of staff that will be using it at every, any given time. The room must be separated from workplaces where hazardous biological and chemical agents are handled. Prohibition. This also refers to workplaces dealing with hazardous chemical and hazardous biological agents. Eating, drinking, smoking is prohibited in all workplaces. Conspicuous signage and notices must be prominently displayed, prohibiting smoking, eating, or drinking. Drinking water also may be taken for granted. In some areas, taps may not, be, may not provide water that is fit for human consumption. In this respect, employees are responsible, employers are responsible for ensuring that it's adequate supply of water safe for drinking for employees. Seats, where reasonably practicable, provide a seat that is ergonomically sound for every employer, employee, permit an employee whose work is done standing to take advantage of any opportunity to sit and provide seats with batteries. Remember that companies where employees do a lot of computer work or in labs where there's a lot of a microscope work and screening, staff take strain from continuous sitting and this um, legislation like this is very valuable to prevent uh, problems that may arise. Condition of rooms and facilities. Maintain all rooms and facilities in a clean, hygienic, safe, whole and leak-free condition and in a good state of repair. Remember that roughly 2.2 square meters of effective open floor area must be available for every employee working in an indoor workspace. I know it's not practical for everyone to actually go and measure the space, but a rough estimate is sufficient. And um, it will be glaring if a workplace is cluttered is uncomfortable, and these are the places that need to be addressed. So, 
As I mentioned in the past slides, these are the responsibilities of managers in terms of the OSH Act. Wherever the OSH Act refers to employer, if you have been designated as a 16.2 appointee, you are the employer. So wherever you see the word employer, that is the responsibility of the manager. So we're now moving on to points to consider in light of COVID-19. So what is coronavirus? Coronavirus is a large family of viruses that causes illness ranging from the common cold to a more severe disease like pneumonia, MERS and SARS. As you can see at the bottom there, this is what SARS means and this is what MERS and you will recall these diseases affected the country a few years back. The common symptoms are fever, difficulty breathing and a dry cough, as well as other issues such as gastro issues, diarrhea or general body aches. So for managers at the workplace, I think this slide is quite relevant and quite important because uh, you would have to have a policy in place to determine um, you know, what steps need to be taken to determine whether an employee was actually um, acquired an infection through the community or whether they acquired the infection at the workplace. In terms of TB, HIV, as well as COVID-19, this is actually very difficult to um, address. However, policies would, must be written and put in place to uh, assist the manager to take the necessary steps and to protect staff. There are broad strategies that you need to consider in controlling COVID-19. These are hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, social distancing, and quarantine or isolation. These are general precautions to be observed by managers, staff, anyone in the workplace or at home. Wash hands as often as possible with soap and water for at least a minimum period of 20 seconds. If soap and water is not available, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 70% alcohol. Avoid touching eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. That is, whenever you are out, try to avoid this. And um, when you get home or when you get back to the office, the first thing you do is wash your hands properly with soap and water, and then you can become comfortable and back to normal. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Stay at home, home if you are sick. Try to keep distance from others at home and in the workplace, including the tea room at your workstation. And it is recommended that the space should be between one to two meters away. Cover your cough or sneeze with a flexed elbow or a tissue, and then throw away the tissue in a bin safely. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces, such as your desk, door handles, telephones, etc. The recommended cleaning agents against um, the COVID-19, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is um, alcohol, which is 70%, ammonia, and um, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, remember, it is important to ensure that when um, these Disinfectants are used. They are used at the proper dilution. They are used for the required contact time. And they are used before expiry to ensure that it, they are actually effective in disinfecting. Recommendation also for international business, business travel must be prohibited in line with government's pronouncements. All local business travel must be limited where possible use technology for further business requirements. That, one, that is why we as NIOH have opted to go the route of providing our trainings on the Zoom platform. There is no, currently no vaccine for COVID-19. However, staff are encouraged to get the vaccine. Ensure that the general health of staff, managers, and all employees are kept uh, are maintained and chronic diseases are well controlled.
This is a uh, hand wash poster that was um, uh, com compiled and is available on the NIOH website. I provided the link to the um, poster. You can uh, print the poster and have it laminated and displayed at workplaces. It adds a lot of value and guidance to staff. Important is that washing must be done for at least 20 seconds. And step-by-step -step procedure gives you exactly the requirements how to achieve a proper hand washing procedure. The next one is a hand sanitizer poster, also compiled by NROH. And this is the URL for you to get to the poster. You can have it print, printed, laminated, and displayed. Hand sanitizer, as we mentioned, is your resort when there is no clean water and soap. And if you sanitizing, these are also the steps that you need to follow in that process. Remember, Department of Labor has also published the Compensation for Occupational and Injuries uh, and Diseases Act, an additional uh, notice for COVID-19. So managers take note that this needs to be complied with in cases where employees have actually uh, contracted the disease through the workplace. This is the NIOH website. Remember colleagues, we have worked tirelessly to uh, develop a whole lot of fact sheets, posters, presentations, videos, documents, information, links, guidelines, etc please utilize our website. It is freely available to all staff, all companies, and all employees. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening so attentively to my presentation. I would like to acknowledge Mr. David Jones, my manager in the SHE department, Dr. Chen, our occupational medicine practitioner for the NHLS, and Ms. Michelle Kole, our waste assurance manager, for assisting and guiding in my presentation. Thank you so much. We've, we've got some time for some questions. So if anyone would like to, to uh, put some questions through, we can, we can see what we can do to assist. A number of people have asked um, online if we can make the presentation available uh, to them. Just a reminder, if you go onto the NIOH website, presentation will be there uh, and so anybody can access it. Uh, let's take a look at, at a few of the questions. Um, and we've got uh, a team here from the NIOH uh, who uh, will attempt to, 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 to answer them. Firstly, considering that some work processes do not have HPAs as posed by the COVID-19 and that this hazard is but an important one, how do you balance this important hazard against the provision of safe working environment? Dr. Graham? Hi, hi everybody. So yes, I think it's an important question. I think we are so used to, to addressing hazards maybe directly to our work within the workplace. And the work environment is continuously changing. So, so risks and hazards will, will present themselves in different forms. Like what's happening now with COVID-19, a new hazard has entered the workplace. While this might not be directly related to a worker's activity in the workplace, it has entered the workplace. So once again, as we shall have emphasized, a risk assessment to how that hazard has been introduced into the workplace needs to be assessed, it needs to be prioritized, and in that way, you balance the existing risks with those that now are emerging. Okay, what do we need to do as an organization should one of the employees test positive for the work, physical workplace, not the people, as this is very clear. Uh, the wording is a little bit confusing, but, but if, I, if I gather from what has happened here is generally what you want to do if an employee tests positive in the, work, in the workplace. There are many guidelines um, on various platforms, but I think the essence is that if an employee tests positive, first and foremost, that employee should be removed from the workplace. 
and that is called isolation. Um, and that because you don't want to expose further workers um, to COVID-19. And then secondly, an important part in, in trying to reduce spread, etc., contact tracing and identifying employees who may have come in contact with that employee needs to take place. And, and that is also very important for managers to know because you would have to um, decide which people came into contact and obviously if there is a contact quarantine or some people might need to, to go off work so as not to further infect and cause further spread. Okay. Uh, <coughs> can you advise on a very practical level? Can you miss one, David? Can a 16.2 oh, okay. appoint another 16.2? I'll take that, yeah. Uh, a 16.2 appointee, as I mentioned, is an appointment from the CEO to a manager in the company. Now, depending on your structure, you may have the CEO, manager, senior manager, then junior manager. So yes, a 16.2 appointee can appoint another 16.2 in the workplace. However, it has to, has to be appointment from a manager to the subordinate. Okay. Can you advise on a very practical level what are the roles and responsibilities of a safety rep, a floor marshal, a fire rep? Are there areas of overlap and how is this addressed? Mm, okay. Um, the safety representative, um, as I mentioned, Section 17 deals with the roles and responsibilities. Most of it is identification of hazards and risks. As I mentioned, the risk assessment is your starting point, your foundation. However, in terms of identifying risks, you've got to do safety inspections, then you've got to do um, risk assessments, you've got to attend meetings, you've got to report unsafe conditions. These are the types of responsibilities of a safety event. Um, in terms of the OSH Act, um, a floor marshal is not really something that has reference in the Act. However, individual organizations would choose to, um, to address or to have these appointments um, would actually then determine what the responsibilities would be. Uh, in general, the health and safety rep has overall responsibility and then uh, followed by um, the fire marshal or the fire warden in some cases call, and then the first aider. So in terms of the, the act and re regulations, these are the three major appointments. So these are, in fact, legal appointments, in addition to the Section 16.2 appointment and the um, manager appointments. All right, next question. In a hospital setting, and I think maybe this is a comment more than a question, but if anyone does want to respond, is it, it is very difficult to get doctors and nurses to wear PPE. Staff often cite discomfort as the primary reason for non-compliance. Anyone would like to comment? Yeah, and I think, I, think, I think that's the reality when it comes to PPE or personal protective equipment. It is, it is awkward and often uncomfortable to wear these devices. That's why when one does a risk assessment and looks at the hazards and identifies various controls, one has to take a very strategic and layered approach in how to control hazards. As Michelle presented, the hierarchy of controls, often PPE is listed as one of the last resorts. There's many other control strategies that should be utilized, uh, elimination, substitution, uh, engineering controls and administration, and lastly PPE. And often, you know, in hospital settings where doctors and nurses work, uh, PP is often used for very direct and pointed procedures and, and often only worn for short periods due to the discomfort that is felt. So the, the overall approach should be a very a, a combined mechanism and strategy to address hazards. And like I say, PP is awkward to wear and, and definitely uncomfortable. Okay. Um, again, a request for the uh, presentation and again let me just mention uh, www.niwh.ac.za you'll be able to get the presentation there 
but you'll also, independently of the, present, of the presentation, be able to access the posters, which we made reference to. They are on the NRH website. Um, bearing in mind the time for the develop, development of symptoms, would you automatically classify an employee presenting with symptoms at work as having been infected in the workplace? So David, you know, once again, um, and Michelle pointed out in her presentation, it's incredibly important to have a very good incident management um, uh, system in place. Uh, it's very important to investigate all incidents, uh, to see uh, were any uh, perhaps standard operating procedures breached, were there any gaps in controls, etc. And the company can make some sort of formulation as to what was the cause um, that led to the infection. Um, naturally, if one believes through the medical process that a COVID-19 infection is work-related, this would then be directed to the Department of Labor through the compensation uh, system where they would make an assessment themselves as to whether such a disease would be compensable or not. The underlying principle that I want to highlight is that every organization needs to undertake an incident investigation because that is the purpose to try and identify gaps in the system and then address it appropriately. Um, will the flu vaccine not weaken our immune system at this time? Um, David, the, the mechanism of how flu vaccine uh, works is that it actually stimulates immunity towards an antigen that has been injected in you through the flu vaccine. So I do not believe that it will weaken your immune system uh, during this time. Okay, legal implications of employer, if an employee got infected at work by a co-worker and then carries this to his or her family, I don't know if any of us are in a position to able to answer that one. It's a very difficult one, David, because I think it's more legal implication, but um, you know, in general, I think once again, it points towards the infection and investigating incidents correctly, because one needs to get an sense and idea of what the contact exposure was, how extensive is the uh, the, the transmission, etc., etc. But in terms of legalities, yes, I think uh, someone with a legal background would be better um, suited to answer that. How do you differentiate whether COVID-19 was acquired at work or in the community? Looking for a guideline on how to go about making this assessment of this so, 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 you know, there's various risk assessment tools and, and the World Health Organization, the WHO, has released um, a tool and there's some documents you can look um, on the internet around how to assess risk exposure in the workplace. I think very often, once again, health and safety reps, managers, people going to investigate the incident and get an idea of what happened is, is key critical. Um, after establishing that, by applying various tools to determine exposure, I think one will then be guided um, by that. It's very difficult in the space of time that we have now to go through all the guidelines, but I direct people to, to look at the internet and look for that um, WHO risk assessment tool on exposure. Okay. Um, would it be advisable to have entry medicals back into the workplace after lockdown to ensure no employees are affected? David, in general, I think the treating uh, practitioner and the treating uh, doctor would be in the best position to know his or her employee, how sick they were, and obviously monitoring during their illness. Um, we have to rely on our colleagues and our medical fraternity to decide whether somebody is able to return back to work. And this is often an issue with a sick note to say the person is able to return to work. Um, the value actually for an employer introducing a, a, a medical assessment upon return, I think would int uh, introduce other challenges. So, so I, I really believe that we need to, 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 to look towards the treating practitioner who is in, in I believe it's the best suited position to decide on whether an employee is able to return to work. Would you not therefore advocate pre-entry visit, visit or workers screening in a live environment with the entry of any visitor and the risk posed is known before they arrive or start work. Various tools are available to be applied in the workplace for this uh, and somebody is quite happy to share something. 
Yes, I, I think I think in general there is quite a bit of there's more literature now coming around COVID nineteen and and what mechanisms or strategies should be put in place how to address employees coming to the work. Um, a lot of the uh, literature that I've seen is based on the SARS outbreak. Now we know that there's a lot of uh, similarities to that. I think what's slightly undiscovered or what we are slowly learning about is the virology of how the virus behaves and, and in terms of incubation can, when, when is somebody um, able to transmit the virus, etc., etc. And that sort of speaks to whether screening within a workplace is advisable or not. And I think people need to read this literature and then decide um, based on what, 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 you, what you have read and what, you, um, what articles you have cited, and what mechanisms you're going to put in place whether to screen uh, employees coming into the workplace. Right. Sorry, I missed the question. Do you have guidelines on a standard temperature we can use during temperature checks in the workplace? Uh, so, 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 you know, once again, this, this, there's varying uh, 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 opinions on this. I think if I look at the literature, the principle is that you want to try and, when you do temperature monitoring, the principle is to try and find somebody who is feverish. Now, the medical definition of a fever is generally about 38 degrees centigrade. So, you know, one would have to then decide and read on the literature and, and based on that principle, decide at which level you want to introduce your temperature standard. Next question. If an employee arrives at work ill or becomes ill with COVID-19 symptoms and they do not have their own transport, how do you get them home or to the clinical hospital? If you ask another employee to transport them, you place that employee at risk. You know, it's, it's, it's David, it's, 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 it's a tricky question and there's no real um, blanket answer to this. I think, I think in general, you're sitting with an employee who is sick, um, you cannot also leave them there. So I think it's sort of a rational approach of allowing, protecting the person, giving them perhaps a, 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 a medical mask if that's available to, to um, prevent them from coughing, out further droplets or sneezing, etc. And then some arrangement needs to be made to get that employee um, to, the, to the hospital or to a medical facility. Right. Should COVID-19 infection be recorded as an Injury on duty and IOD? Um, yes, David, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, all in injuries, diseases, etc., must be recorded. If it is confirmed that it has been workplace acquired, then it must be reported and recorded as an IOD. All right. Uh, question What entails a health risk assessment? Um, and maybe just to mention, uh, on the NIOH website, we've got a whole presentation on risk assessment with uh, guidance and, if I'm not mistaken, a document as well. Uh, and I would suggest uh, they go to uh, www.nioh.ac.za and I think you'll get all the assistance you need regarding that one. Uh, when we reopen, will it be a legal requirement that all companies must go back to the basics and input COVID as part of a company risk assessment? Yes, um, it is a legal requirement because as I mentioned, the risk assessment needs to identify all risks in the workplace and currently it is a risk in South Africa and internationally. So COVID-19 definitely needs to be included as part of the company risk assessment or the workplace risk assessment for that. Event. How will you prove that the employee contact, uh, contracted the COVID-19 at the workplace? Do we need to investigate where the employee might have contracted the virus? Should we just process the claims through COIDA, regardless where the employee contracted the coronavirus? You know, David, once again, I think, I think practically it's about being reasonable. In some circumstances, it may be, may be very obvious. You might have a lab worker who it's their job to process a, a specimen and, and for some other reason, systems have failed and that person becomes infected. Um, that is, that perhaps it's obvious that there was an exposure incident. 
I do understand that in other areas it's a little bit more uncertain, especially as Michelle indicated when it comes through the community. So in other words, a worker might have been at home, um, quieted in whatever way, whether that's through the shopping centre, then brought it into the workplace and then develop symptoms and test positive. Now, you know, at the end of the day, an investigation needs to take place and, and have a look at was any reasonable, uh, was there any, a, a reasonable chance that this was acquired in the workplace? And if that is the case, the attending physician needs to then fill out the documents and uh, submit it, and even the employer uh, to labor to have, a, have an adjudication on that matter. Okay. What about suspected cases of COVID-19? And an example is given, a dentist in Gauteng was recently diagnosed positive for COVID-19 and only allowed to self-isolate thereafter. And during the time in between, she worked and possibly continued to infect staff and patients. Is this not risky behavior by management by not allowing immediate self-isolation? COVID-19 is, is, is so similar to, uh, in terms of symptoms, to flu, uh, to the common cold, etc. And that's why it makes it sometimes very difficult to decide clinically whether somebody's infected or not. I think based on the National Institute of Communicable Diseases NICD definition of somebody who may be exposed, that is the guideline on, on which somebody should isolate, quarantine, and test, etc. I think there's general consensus now that should somebody become ill with symptoms akin to COVID-19, it is advisable that that person self-isolate and quarantine and test, especially if they are in the public and treating the public so that uh, 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 knowledge can be gained whether, whether you have the infection or not. Okay, another question, would it be reasonable to appoint the health and, sa uh, health and safety environment manager at 16.2, that person has no control over the budget or has no direct line to the CEO? Um, I'm not sure about that, David, because um, in most cases, I would think that the HSC uh, group manager would actually be um, have some degree of control over the budget, as quite a lot of um, responsibilities lie with this department and this individual. And um, also, they would, they should be direct um, or some. Uh, line of contact between this individual and the CEO. Um, there was another question where they say they could could there be more than one 16.2? And I answered yes because there could be senior management that the CEO appoints um, the 16.2 appointment too, and then um, that manager as as well um, ha has um, delegated certain responsibilities a manager below him. And in that case, um, they can be more than one. So um, I'm not too sure in terms of an HSP manager as far as whether... That's just another point to add to that, if I may. But uh, appointing a 16.2, the CEO has not uh, removed responsibility. And if they're going to appoint a 16.2, it makes no difference. The uh, CEO, the head of the company, still is responsible irrespective of uh, the appointment. Um, can employees refuse to work if the employer <laughs> runs out of PPE? And it's, it looks to me like its specific context would be COVID and it's during the lockdown period and there is a, obviously a, a documented risk assessment which indicates the need for the PPE with its uh, respirators, masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, whatever the control measures are. Anyone want to give a thought on that one? In terms of the Act, the General Admin Regulations, um, the employer is actually in charge of, of supervising and ensuring that employees actually um, are provided with and where the required PPE. Um, with regards to an employee, part of their duties is that they must comply with any instructions given to them. So if you taking it from directly from the act, yes, an employee can refuse to work. But um, we know the current setup that there is a shortage of uh, PPE 
So they must look at um, other possible alternatives, I would think. So, you know, to maintain safety. And as we mentioned, uh, engineering controls uh, are very effective. Administrative controls are effective. And um, we, we should be able to, we have to look at other alternatives and safety is of utmost importance. Okay. Um, where do we have to, uh, what type of training, OHS training, would you deem to be sufficient for 16.2 to fulfill their role and responsibilities uh, from an OHS point of view uh, to ensure public uh, compliance with the Act? And if anyone's got any thoughts, if appointed a 16.2, what training does that person need to be able to fulfill their role? In terms of the Act, the, um, the duties of the employer is actually the duties of the Section 16.2 appointee. So um, what I went through in terms of the duties of the employer, those are the very duties that this person needs to be trained on. And sorry, coming back to the previous question, um, also uh, the employee, uh, just being informed that the employee can actually also consult the Department of Labor in terms of the uh, uh, lack of PPE in certain situations. All right. Um... Would you recommend all healthcare workers wear a mask for COVID-19? There would seem to be a lot of unhappiness in areas, uh, including the province with regard to this. You know, David, I think this question comes up quite often and it's always very difficult to answer this accurately without having seen exactly what the workplace is and what the duties are expected of those persons. That is why the risk assessment must be analysed and done properly at the site by the workers, by those involved. That will then dictate whether masks are required to wear. So in general here, when it says all healthcare workers, it's very difficult to say all healthcare workers. But, in, but, but, but there's, there's some very good information on the fact sheets of healthcare workers on the NIOH website, which speaks to perhaps high-risk procedures and guides what needs to be worn, um, etc. But I would really direct people to look exactly at what the risk assessment says and what measures then are dictated by that. All right. Again, a guideline on a standard temperature. Do you want to just give um, me yeah, two minutes again? Um, once again, Dave, we answered this before. I think the principle of doing temperature monitoring is to try and pick up fever. And uh, fever medically is defined by a temperature greater than 38 degrees centigrade. But like I say, this you will have to go and look at what uh, what standard you want to implement in terms of temperature monitoring. Advice regarding health and safety, legal responsibility, or implications in an office park environment. Uh, there's multiple occupancies, many different people who rent, many different companies. Um, any thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at the act again, it is you have a legal responsibility to protect the health and safety of your staff. So irrespective of whether you're sharing the environment with another company, your workplace is your particular office, your staff member is your responsibility. Uh, however, there might be cases where the general um, uh, office park has like a, a general policy. You can, if you are in agreement, align your policies with that so that you streamline processes like um, uh, emergency evacuations, uh, first aid equipment, etc. But um, irrespective, you still have to have your own uh, health and safety program in place. All right, thank you. How do you distinguish normal flu from COVID-19? Uh, David, the only way to do that is through a laboratory test. Um, you cannot distinguish the two clinically because they have this very similar, similar uh, presenting symptoms. So the only way is through a laboratory or through, yeah, through testing. All right, I think we've overshot our time about five minutes already. Um, we're going to need to wrap it at this point. Uh, we just want to thank everyone for joining us. We hope it's been informative. And uh, we encourage you to have a look in our continuing to do presentations 
as we go forward and we'd encourage you to join us as we present on different topics. Have a good Easter weekend. Thank you. We are going to address Oh, and, and questions that you've got, we will still address going forward. Yes, thank you. Thanks.